Micah, chapter 4. We'll begin reading together at verse 1. I'll read to verse 3, and we'll get into our study. Micah, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills. Peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations far off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The first three chapters, as we've been going through the book of Micah, deal with God bringing judgment, and we've been seeing that as we've been going through this book. And we've seen that God is bringing judgment on the nation uh, for a variety of reasons, but especially because of their idolatry. And last time we were together, we were in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, I was pointing out that the false prophets of Israel were going to be judged because they were leading people astray. Remember what it says in chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, how it says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him, who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore you shall have uh, night without vision, you shall have darkness without divination, the sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there's no answer from God. So he had spoken, and he had said that he was going to bring judgment especially speaking concerning these false prophets. But in contrast, as we've been going through the book of Micah, Micah has made it very clear that in contrast to the false prophets, that he himself was a true prophet. He had said in chapter 3, verse 8, Truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. And so he said that I am, a, this is what he's saying. He is saying, I am a true prophet. I've been sent by God. I have a message. It is a message that will reveal the transgression of the nation. And I, as a, a prophet, am full of the Holy Spirit. And that's one who is empowering me. And so as this is taking place, and as he's bringing this message, we've already seen this, but let me refresh your memory. Uh, he was speaking the truth to them, but they, they wanted him to, to be quiet. They wanted him to leave them alone. In, in chapter 2, we had seen at verse 6, they had said, do not prattle, you say to those who prophesy, so they shall not prophesy to you. They shall not return insult for insult. You say to them, shut up. Don't be telling us these things. We don't want to hear it. You're just rambling on. And so he says, as a true prophet, I've brought a word of judgment that is to come. The false prophets are saying to you that there is peace, but God had st stated in other places, uh, they say there is going to be peace, but there is no peace. And so we've been looking at the contrast between the message of the true prophet and the message the false prophets were bringing. Now somebody says, how do you know the difference between a true prophecy and a false prophecy? How do you know that in the Bible when you're reading it, what was true and what was not true? How did the children of Israel know when something was true and when something was not true. And all you need to do, if you take notes, you might want to note Deuteronomy chapters 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 18. Those two chapters early in the history of Israel were given to the children of Israel in order that as God was speaking to them, that they would be able to test whether or not somebody was speaking in the name of the Lord. In chapter 13, it speaks concerning those who are coming and speaking. And he says, what they're saying may come to pass, but the problem is, if this person says, come and let us follow other gods, God says, do not follow that person because I have not sent him. Then later on, and I'll read this to you, in chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, 
He said in verse 21 and 22, if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So on the one hand, if a false prophet speaks and takes you away from God, he said, be not afraid of that prophet. He is not speaking for me. He's taking you away from me. Or if the person is speaking and what he says does not come to pass, he's speaking presumptuously, and thus you shall have no fear of him. You see, a true prophet in the Old Testament is really clearly uh, presented as a person who, when they give a prophecy, it brings honor and glory to God, and it's always 100% accurate. And so that's how you see it. So we're coming up uh, pretty soon to New Year's, and they'll have these magazines or these newspapers that are at the checkout stand when you're leaving uh, the store, and it'll say, you know, five prophets making their prophecies for 2017. And you can take that home and use it to line the birdcage because none of that <laughs> is true. They're always, always wrong. And God says, don't believe them because they're not speaking for me. Well, Micah was speaking in the name of the Lord. Micah was a true prophet. And because he's a true prophet, he was speaking the mind of the Lord to the nation that had walked away from him, a nation that was beginning to mix the worship of God with paganism. And so when he came and spoke to them and said to them, you're doing these things and it is wrong and God will bring judgment, that's when they began to say, uh, don't prattle to me. Don't be just running your mouth off. I don't want to hear it. You see, the people had sinned, and now it's necessary for God to chastise them. And the punishment that he's bringing as we're looking at these chapters together is severe, but it is intended to bring them back to him. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 8, verse 5, it says, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. So God is bringing judgment, a punishment upon you because that's what fathers do. In Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, it reads, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. And so because he loves them, he's going to deal with their sin. And uh, the judgment will be severe, but he will not completely abandon them. And so what we see here as we open up chapter 4 is that the chapter begins with a prophecy, a prophecy of future glory. It will still speak of judgment. We'll see that as we go through chapter 4. But it also reveals God's intention for their future. So beginning at verse 1, it says, It shall come to pass... In the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Now, you might notice, those of you who've been walking with the Lord for a while, those of you who've been reading your Bible and all, you might notice that these verses here are very similar to verses you find in another prophetic book. It's found in the book of Isaiah. There is, these, there is a similarity to what is being said here that was stated in the time of Isaiah. And you need to remember that Micah and Isaiah actually lived and ministered at the same time. And they prophesied a similar message on occasion. And so when you take these verses and it says, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God, Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths out of Zion. The law shall go forth the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, you can see a similar thought in Isaiah chapter 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, and I'm going to read it to you, verses 2 through 4, this is what Isaiah said. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so these contemporaries were given by the Spirit of the Lord 
a similar message. And so you'll, that's why you'll see it in Isaiah, and that's why you'll see the same thing here in Micah. We need to remember that the nation is filled with idolatry. And as we've been looking at Micah, as well as Amos, we noticed that uh, it was governed, the nation was governed by thieves who were ruling by violence and graft. And justice was no longer afforded to the least in society, the widows and the orphans. And because of this, God had said that he would turn his hand against them as if they were his enemies. And the reason he was going to do that is he was going to cleanse the evil from amongst them but he wasn't going to completely destroy them. You see, the cleansing ultimately will occur completely in the future, and that is going to lead to restoration. We'll see that in just a moment in this chapter. Now, these promises that we're looking at here in Micah and the same promises that were given in Isaiah were what are called messianic. They refer to Messiah. And so this is foretelling the future work that God is going to perform through Messiah for them. When you look in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in chapter 33, verses 15 and 16, it says, In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. And so this is a prophecy concerning the time that Messiah will rule and reign. Now, God's promise is that he's going to restore them when Messiah rules and reigns in Jerusalem. When Messiah rules, all transgression will be dealt with. When you look back in Isaiah, if you take notes, Isaiah 1 verse 28, it reads, the destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Well, Micah is echoing a similar prophecy as he proclaims this to the, uh, to the nation. Now, in Micah chapter 3, verse 12, he had, pro he had predicted that Jerusalem would be leveled and become a heap of ruins. But now he moves beyond the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon as well as the future destruction through Rome. And he, and he moves beyond all destructions of the city and he begins to speak of what he calls the latter days. Notice that in verse 1, it shall come to pass in the latter days. Latter days are also referred to in Scripture as the last days, also spoken of as the last times. And so this is speaking specifically of end time events. The last days is a technical term. And it, what it does is it speaks of God moving in judgment against all evil. And Jesus uses a similar term, but he actually speaks of the last days in this way. He'll speak of tribulation, and he'll also speak of great tribulation. And as we're studying Matthew, some of you are traveling with me through Matthew, and we're going to enter into chapter 19 someday. And then just a few chapters later, another year and a half, we'll be looking at chapter 24. And in chapter 24 of Matthew, that's where Jesus gives us this uh, tremendous insight into future events. And so he speaks concerning the time that is referred to as Jacob's trouble. It's referred to as tribulation. But Jesus will speak of it as not only tribulation, which refers to the first three and a half years of this tribulation period. But then he says, and then shall there be great tribulation. So the tribulation period which is a seven-year period where God pours out his wrath on Christ rejecting the Christ-rejecting world. It's called the tribulation. It's divided into two aspects. There is tribulation and then great tribulation. Three and a half years of, of tribulation, three and a half years of what is called great tribulation. And so as we're looking at this, that all makes up part of what is called the last days, last times. And so that's what he's referring to here when he's speaking concerning the latter days. See, the tribulation is, is relatively short. It's, it's seven years. But in the tribulation, at the end of it, is when Jesus will return to earth. The return of Christ concludes the tribulation, and then he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And so the last days includes the tribulation, the return of Jesus, and what is called the millennial kingdom or the thousand-year reign of Christ. And so that helps us when you understand that 
That helps us to see that Micah is not speaking of near events alone, but he's speaking, when he uses the term latter days, he's speaking of distant future events. And so in this time, in verse 1, he says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. And so the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established, he says, on the top of the mountains. Zechariah 14 in verse 10 says, All the land shall be turned into a plain, but Jerusalem shall be raised up. And so there's going to be a time when it is the center, if you will. And the people, it says, will flow to it. In other words, many nations shall come and they're going to speak uh, speak and desire to know more of the Lord. It's interesting how it says that people shall flow to it. That word flow is an interesting word that, that speaks of being driven by an internal desire. There's going to be something within them that is going to provoke them internally to want to go up to the mountain of the Lord in order to worship. There's going to be something that causes them to say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. Why? He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. There's going to be an internal drawing to the people to want to come and to worship the Lord. There's going to be something marvelous that is within that causes them to desire to hear the word of the Lord. Now that in, is in the very end. We have a, a foretaste of that, by the way, now. When I... When I um, was a young man before I got saved, if you'd have said to me, let's go to a party, I'd have said, yes, let us go. <laughs> and and uh, many of you in this room know exactly what I mean. There's going to party where? Where's it going to be? Let's get out of here. Let's go. And is it, it, it didn't matter if it was on Friday. It didn't matter if it was Saturday or Wednesday. It didn't matter. Party? Yes. That's something I enjoy. Let's go. That was just the way it is. But if you'd have said to me, which it was on occasion, hey, you want to go to a Bible study? <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Why would I want to go to a Bible study? Of course not. Why would I do that? I, I didn't get witnessed to, by the way, very much during my young teen years, but I do remember in 1966, it was the summer of 1960, actually the summer of 1967. I was 16 yet to be 17. I was at the beach. I believe it was Newport. And I was laying there as a 16, almost 17-year-old boy. And a friend of mine, Bill, who I meet with now, you know, every month, and uh, mentor, we were kids just laying on our beach blankets, watching the bikinis walk by. I still remember, I still remember a guy walking up to me and kneeling down, wanting to talk to me about God. He wanted to witness to me about Jesus. I only was witnessed to maybe two or three times before I came to faith in Christ by strangers. But I do remember that because I was always fairly respectful to believers in God, just not interested in their beliefs. But I remember how awkward it felt that here I am taking in all of these bouncing beauties as they're going by in their bikinis. And this guy wants to talk to me about good stuff, about God and holiness. And you've got to be kidding me, you know. You're ruining my daydream. I was that way. If there was a party, yes. If there's, you know, drinking and, and drugs, absolutely. If they give it to you for free, that's even better. That was my life, and that's the life of many in this room. Many of you understand what I'm saying. Partying and all of that. I had a hunger for that. That was what drove me. The next party, the next drink, the next joint, that's a fact. That's what drove me at that time. Then I got saved. 
come and let us go to the house of the Lord became the internal driving of my life. Whereas I used to go to the party to get high, now I went to church to get, we used to call it a spiritual high. And I loved the spiritual high because I never took the risk of being pulled over for driving under the influence of the spirit. <laughs> I just, they didn't arrest me and make me do any of those little walks and this like that. You know what I'm saying? There was no Holy Ghost hangovers. You know, and I wasn't worried about the harm that I had done to somebody the night before or what I had stolen from them or whatever. I didn't have any of that anymore. And so as when I got saved at the age of 20, as I used to be so excited about going to a party, and some of you know what I'm saying, when, you know, yeah, let's go party. Now they were saying, there's a Bible study. There's a Bible study in La Habra, man. There's a Bible study in Long Beach. There's a Bible study in Costa Mesa. And we'd say, let's go. And see, that's that internal drive. I don't know if someone forced you to come to church tonight. Some of you probably, yeah. But see, I wasn't forced to go to Bible studies. I said, come and let us go to the house of the Lord. There's this internal pushing, this desire to be in the word, to be around those who love Jesus Christ. Listen, all day long, I walk in the world and my feet get dirty from that walk. And I need a place where my feet can be washed. And Jesus is the one who takes that basin and takes that towel and puts your feet in it and washes it. And that comes through the word of God. And so for me, it's exciting to be able to get into the word of God. And it's more exciting when the word of God gets in me because it changes my life. You see, that's how you make the best decisions. The best decisions you'll ever make are the ones led by the Spirit. The worst ones are the ones that are not informed by the Word of God. And you just go out and say, well, let's see. No, I want to make my decisions based on the Spirit's leading and the Word's direction. And so there's a hunger, and that's what this is speaking about. People will flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the house of the Lord. There's a divine drive, that, that, that internal desire. And, and they want to go, and, and it's, it's one of these things that it's a spontaneous movement that they all gather together, and, and people are going to recognize that God is once again with his people, and they will be internally driven to worship him. Zechariah tells us in chapter 8, verse 23, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. I want to go with you. Some of you have had friends who have said this to you in a similar way. They're not saying it like, they're not grabbing your sleeve necessarily and saying, I know that God is with you. But they're saying things like, what's happened to you? What happened to you? Something's different about you. And then you say, you know what? I got my life right with the Lord. That's how it was with me when I first got saved. I got right with the Lord. Really, where are you going? I go to Calvary Chapel. Really? God is with you. And my friends came. My friends would come to church because they saw there's something in me that they don't have. And that's what's going to take place in these latter days that he's speaking about. They'll take the sleeve and they'll say, we have heard that God is with you. You see, when Messiah reigns, the nation of Israel will be known as the headquarters of Messiah. And when people desire to worship God, they will come to those they know worship him. That's how you, by the way, can be the best witness. Somebody said, I wish I could quote the person who said it. We all know this quote. Preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. Live the gospel out. May that be the way that we live so that people actually will look at, at us and say, what is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you. What is it that has made you different? Now, they may not say it like that. They may even be sarcastic. They may even kind of uh, put you down a little bit. They may want to shame you. Well, you know, but they're, they're saying the same thing. What they're saying is something happened to you, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know whether or not I think it's good or bad, but I would like to know what it is. And then you say, you know, I got saved. That's what happened to me. 
I had a friend of mine, his name was Paul. Paul lived in a place up north, Pacific Grove. I got saved. I went with my friend Bill and another guy, um, another guy named Bill. We drove from Norwalk. We went up to Pacific Grove, and I wanted to visit my friend Paul. And when we went there to his house, it was just before I went into the military. When we went to his apartment, as I came in with my two friends, Paul said, Dave, wait a minute. I invited some friends. I wanted them to meet you. And I said, oh, really? Now, Paul was from Whittier, but now he's living in Pacific Grove. I happen to think Pacific Grove is a beautiful place, by the way. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to go up there. It's a gorgeous place. And so as I was up there, I was thinking, what a beautiful place this is. And Paul's living in a little apartment there. And uh, it's really nice. And I hadn't been there uh, for uh, about four months. And the last time I had been there was during a time that was called the Monterey Pop Festival. They used to have something called the Monterey Pop Festival. Some of you are old enough to remember that. Others of you have studied in ancient rock and roll history. It was called Monterey Pop Festival, and they had all kinds of music and things. It was a big festival and this and that. And I had gone there a few months before. I had dropped something called psilocybin, and I had been smoking dope for several days and stuff, and that's the last time I'd seen Paul. You know, I was on hallucinogenics and smoking marijuana. Now I'm back, but he thinks I'm the same guy that I was just a few months before. So he invites his friends to meet me, and he says, I'd like you to meet my friends. And I'm just kind of there with Paul. I'm not really speaking to him because we're waiting for the friends. And they come into the house, and there's two or three guys who come in, and he says, this is how he introduced me. He said, guys, I want you to meet David. He's one of my best friends. I've known him since high school. This is the guy, he said, concerning me. This is the guy that got me high for the very first time. That was my introduction. Now, would you like that to be your, your legacy? Would you like that? I didn't want that. I didn't want to be known for the guy who turned him on to drugs. And there I am. So I still remember I was sitting there, 20 years old, brand new in the Lord. I hadn't been a Christian more than, more than a month and a half, no more than two at the maximum. And I'm there looking at him across this small front room, and he says, this is Dave. He got me high the first time. And his friends are looking at me like, well, I was some guru or something, you know. <laughs> That's true. I had that spacey look. I looked like John Lennon. I used to have these round glasses, and my hair was long, and I had these bushy sideburns, and they're looking at me like I was some guru. And I said, you know, Paul, last time I was here, you know, we got high. And then I said, yeah, that's true. I said, that's true. I, I, I got Paul loaded for the first time when he was in high school. That's true. But I came here for a different reason. I told Paul and, and these guys that were there, and I'm a brand new Christian, and I said, but I came here for a different reason. I want you to know, Paul, and you guys too, that Jesus Christ died on a cross to save me of my sins. He's cleansed me from all of my unrighteousness. I'm born again, and I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ now. So the way I was is no longer that man is dead, and the man who is in this room with you right now has come with a message. And Paul, the reason I came with this message is I want you saved too. See, that's what God does. He changes your life. You don't want to see your friends perish and go to hell. You want them to go to heaven too. It has been said that the most selfish man is the one who goes to heaven alone. And you don't want that. That's why you tell people about the Lord. That's why you come to Bible studies on a midweek when you could be doing something like watching the Dodger game, which I'm T-bowing. <laughs> so are you. Unless you're an Angels fan. <laughs> then you'll just be, who cares, right? Come and let us go into the house of the Lord. He shall teach us his ways. And we will learn his path. We will follow his path. And so that's what we're looking at right now. In Isaiah 55, verse 5, Surely you will summon nations you, you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. He says in verse 2, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. 
He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. Out of Zion, the law shall go forth, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So when Jesus reigns, people come to him to learn how to worship him. And these are coming to be taught by Messiah. They're not coming for information. They are coming for equipping. And he's teaching them. When it speaks concerning the word teach, he shall teach. That word teach simply means to instruct or direct. It, it also carries the connotation of pointing something out. Isaiah 54, 13 says, All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In John 6, 45, Jesus said, It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. They'll be taught by God. They come to him. It's another way of saying that he's the fulfillment of those prophecies. He will teach us the ways. The word way is, is a habit of life. It speaks really of your moral character. When he uses the word walk, the walk is your, uh, your manner of living. It's how you proceed in life, if you will. And the path is, uh, is, uh, is the, the path that a traveler will follow. It's speaking of a way of life. The point he's making is that Jesus will teach us how to live. He will not only instruct us with things that inform us, but he will show us how to live in a way that is most blessed. In verse 3, it says, He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Notice how it says, He shall judge between many peoples. The word judge speaks of to decide, a deciding a controversy or executing judgment. It carries with it the connotation of ruling or governing. So there's no need of a world court when Jesus is the one settling all disputes. Psalm 9 verse 8 says, He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the people in, un, un, in uprightness. So he settles conflicts. And as he settles these conflicts, peace, that is the fruit of righteousness, will begin to exist. You see, you might want to note this. Without righteousness, there can never be peace. Keep that in mind. Now, I, I appreciate the cessation of wars and violence. I do. I served in the military. I did my duty to God and country. But that does not mean that I wanted to go and use my weapon. And It doesn't mean that was my heart, my desire. I desire peace. I've always desired peace. And uh, it was coming to Christ to help me to realize that without Christ, there is no chance of peace. See, Peace comes when there's a cessation of hostility, not just with man. Peace comes when there's a, a cessation of hostility between man and his God. When you hear the gospel of reconciliation, that, Christ was, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, the message of the gospel is called the message of reconciliation, the cessation of hostility. When you, by faith, receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and you abide by the uh, terms of peace, which is that I fully surrender to God. He is the victor. I am the vanquished. He owns me now. I am not on loan to him, but I have been bought at a price. And when I understand that he is my Lord, and I will do the things that he says, and I'll demonstrate I love him by my obedience, the fruit of my life will demonstrate that there has been a change I will have peace with him because he gave me peace in that I, I stopped my war, I surrendered, and now, and this is where it's so very practical, I can live at peace with other people. And so, hostility ceases first between man and God, 
and then under Christ, because the hostility has ceased, then hostility can cease between man and other men. Nations, in other words, can actually live at peace with one another. As he rules, the things that cause division between nations are going to be settled by the Messiah. And so they're no longer going to need to learn war anymore. And it speaks concerning the swords. And uh, it, it says they shall, they shall beat, in verse 3, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Swords. Well, obviously we know that a sword is a military weapon. And a sword is a, a, a picture of killing and destruction. Plowshares uh, would be used to speak of producing crops. So plowshares speaks of the betterment of and care for people. There's an interesting, many of you know this, there's an interesting bronze sculptor in the North Gardens of the, the UN headquarters. And, and this sculptor is, is, is called, um, Let Us Beat Our Swords Into Plowshares. It was created by a Soviet artist, and it was donated on December 4th, 1959, intending to symbolize man's desire to put an end to war and to convert a means of destruction into creative tools for the benefit of mankind. You can see that all you need to do is, is go to the almighty Google, and you can look up the sculptor, let us beat our swords into plowshares, and it'll show you that particular um, statue, if you will. So instead of learning to fight, Jesus teaches us to walk in peace with one another. In Psalm 46, verse 9, he makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. And that's what he's speaking about in the time of peace under the Messiah's rule. In verse uh, 4, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. So, so you're not going to need to have any kind of alarms in your house anymore and those decorative bars that some people put on their windows. You're not going to need those anymore. When it speaks concerning everyone being seated under his vine and under his fig tree, that's a picture of, uh, of prosperity, safety, and security. That's what that's a picture of. It speaks of lounging, if you will. So they're going to be secure. They're going to be at peace. In Zechariah 13, 10, it reads, In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. So it's a picture of, of just, you know, just having a real nice, relaxed life. Don't you look forward to that, by the way? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I look forward to that so much when, when, the, when all the anxiety and tension is finally gone. And I'm not talking about your children moving out. I'm talking about real. <laughs> Some of the more relaxing times you ever have, if you have a chance to, can be just sitting down under a tree by the water's edge at a lake or something. Just kind of just hanging out, drinking a cup of coffee and saying, oh, the world is good. I'm at peace with God. This year is relaxing. How often do you get to do that? Very seldom, probably. Some of you do it every Sunday. You should be here. But uh, <laughs> it's some of the more peaceful times that you have. We just have no agenda other, just, other than just let's relax and just enjoy, enjoy ourselves. Huh? And that's, that's what he's speaking about, the time when all the tension is gone and you're at peace with one another and uh, you're in a state of relaxation. Why? Because Messiah is ruling. Now, I better hurry up. Verse 5, for all people... Walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. See, in the past, people walked after their own gods. The result was war and problems. Their idolatry led them into violence as well as evil. But when Messiah rules, all will honor him and all will follow him. And in the future, all will walk in the name of the Lord. Like it says in Psalm 145, verse 2, Every day I will bless you. 
I will praise your name forever and ever. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we'll be there just worshiping and praising him. And all this is a picture of that time. Well, in verse 6, in that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcast, those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant, the outcast, a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. And so he's speaking concerning his rule. And in the millennial kingdom, the nation of Israel, which is pictured as being lame, you know, crippled, outcast, the remnant. Well, in the millennial kingdom, in the time when Jesus is ruling and reigning, Israel will be restored. In their long history, much suffering occurred, and they were in a position of need. And God acknowledges it was he who afflicted them, but not only did he afflict them, but he will also comfort them. It's like what the psalmist, one of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 51, verse 8, where the psalmist said, Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. What an interesting thing to say, the bones that you have broken. Do you want to be deep with the Lord? You want to know the ways of the Lord? The Lord has a way of breaking us and healing us. I've mentioned this recently, but I don't remember how recent, where I gave a message 30-some years ago that I still remember the title. It was, well, I kind of remember the title, uh, When God Cripples. It was, the, it, was, it was taken out of the book of Genesis where, where Jacob wrestled with the angel, and the Lord, the angel, reaches over and touches the hip of Jacob and withers the sinew there. And from that moment on, from that time on, Jacob walked with a limp. It was a, a constant reminder of his encounter with God. He had grabbed hold of the angel, would not allow, would, would hold on, was holding on tightly, and the angel said, let me go. And, the, and Jacob said, no, I will not unless you bless me. You remember that story. I will not unless you bless me. Angel reaches down and, and touches his hip and withers the bone, cripples him, and, and when I gave that message, it was, a, it was something the Lord was teaching me then that he has been teaching me now for over 30 years, that one lesson. And that is, when I break a man, I will use the man. Uh, when I break the man, I will use the man. You will never be used by God until you are broken by God. And he will put in you a reminder. And some, that's why some people don't want to be used like that. People want all the blessings without the buffetings. That's a fact, isn't it? Just pour your blessings on me, Lord. Blow, you know, blow your spirit on me. Oh, thank you. And I'll float and I'll do all these things and I'll get all this blessing and everything. Well, the Lord says, you want to be like me? Yes, I do. Oh, I, we sing songs like that. Make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. Uh, do you know how I want to make you like me? Yeah, you want to just say, abracadabra, you're like me, right? No. I will make you wounded because I was wounded. You want to be like me? You're going to have Gethsemanes. You want to be like me? You will be pierced. You want to be like me? You will have friends who will forsake you and flee. You want to be like me? Well, you know, on second thought. See, that's, this is, by the way, you know, this may be foreign to some of you, what I just said. That's because there's so much fluff that comes over the airwaves today that all you hear is like, yeah, whoopee. But I've discovered something. I've discovered that the deeper the break, the deeper the wound, the deeper the saint. You know, and what is it that Paul said? He said that the messenger was Satan, was sent to buffet me, and three times I said, God, remove it, and God said, no. My grace is sufficient because, he said, my strength is perfected in weakness. And thus, he said, I just... just just then buffet me. 
because I want to be like you. Listen, there are not too many people who want to take that road, who want to be deep with God. But you know what? There's, what, what, other, what other road is better than to be like him when you think about it? I mean, isn't he conforming us into his image? So quick, quit kicking against the prods. The Lord is fashioning you in answering that prayer that you prayed when you said, make me like you, Lord. I want to be like you. I honestly, I'll just go one more moment with this and then we'll get into the rest of the study. I honestly, when I got saved, was surprised by the joy of the Spirit. I was, I, I was so overwhelmed by the joy of the Spirit. But I have discovered in the 40-some years that I walk with God now, there have been a lot of breakings in my life. And a lot of times people don't, when they come in here, David Rosales, you know, sometimes David Rosales will weep and they don't know why. It's because I'm touched by the infirmities of people in a way I've never been. And it, my, I'm breaking before you. And I'm saying, God, pour your spirit out on us, on me. Make me like you, Lord. And yeah, I smile and I have joy. But Jesus, Jesus also wept. And, and when you see the society the way that it is without him, why aren't more of us weeping? Why aren't more of us broken? Because it needs Jesus. Doesn't this world need Jesus? Listen, it doesn't need Trump. And it doesn't need Hillary. It needs the Lord. And, and we really need to bring Jesus to this nation. We really do. We really, really, really do. Now, moving on, I got to hurry. I got to hurry because we're supposed to have communion. And I was planning on being done by now. But I'm not. So I will finish. Here we go. Where am I? Okay. Verse 8. You, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. The kingdom. While the kingdom was mighty under David, it was mighty under Solomon, but under Messiah, it will be much greater. In verse 9, now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and you shall go even to Babylon. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies." In the near future, Babylon will come. Babylon will conquer that nation. We know through history that King Nebuchadnezzar came against Judah three times and left it in ruins. And the suffering of the people is described like the pain of labor. You see, in the future, there's going to be a time called the tribulation. The pain will be intense. Destruction will be terrible. Many will suffer. Many will die. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 says it like this. It shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. One-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. Each one will say, the Lord is my God. And so he says, you're going to go through this terrible purging it's the tribulation that he's referring to. In Matthew 24, 22, Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So he's speaking concerning this time that's going to come, the tribulation, where so much pain. So it's not just speaking about the events that are in the near history or in the near future of Babylon and all, but going on further into those last days. And then finally, verse 11 through 13, now also many nations have gathered against you who say, let her, let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. He will gather them like, like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughters of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. I will make your hooves bronze, 
You shall be in pieces. Many peoples, I will consecrate their gain to the Lord, their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. So ultimately, there will be uh, nations that will come against them and all. But God says, in that day, I will be your help. And your help, and I'll close with this. I actually had a whole study I was going to give you out of Ezekiel 38. I might introduce next week with that. Probably won't. I'm just saying that so you'll think I am. <laughs> but I'll conclude it because we need to. I want to celebrate communion with you. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. In that day, when the nations do come against them, and it looks like they're about to be destroyed, Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak concerning this. In that day, their help will not come from man. Their help will come from God. And God will allow them to go through the purging, but he ultimately will rescue them.